It was launch day without the fire and rumble this week at the Kennedy Space Center. The crew of STS-130 streaked in from Houston on their supersonic T-38s, donned their launch and re-entry or pumpkin suits, and then went through the motions of launch day. The dress rehearsal is called the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test, or TCDT. The exercise ends with a simulated launch pad abort and later a spin in an armored personnel carrier. As for the vehicle that will take them to space, Endeavor is doing fine. Although the piece of the space station that sits in her trunk, the Tranquility Node, is still giving the shuttle team a mental workout. Cooling lines that carry ammonia failed a leak test a few weeks ago. The team is working to improve the hose design while also beefing up and piecing together some smaller sections. They're calling the result Franken-hose. The shuttlers are still hoping for a February 7th launch. Sometimes it's just nice to get out of the house, isn't it? Not so easy if you happen to be sealed up in some aluminum cans in low Earth orbit. That said, station keepers Max Sarayoff and Jeff Williams took the Soyuz for a spin around the space station the other day. They were careful not to exceed the speed limit, 17,500 miles an hour, as they parked at the new Poisk docking port. But that was not their number one task. They are vexed by a clogged potty, apparently too much calcium in their urine. You know what they say, too much calcium and urine trouble. Now to the fourth rock, where one of NASA's orbiters has its ears cupped, listening for an unlikely call from NASA's Mars Phoenix lander. Phoenix, you'll recall, landed near the North Pole in May 2008 and sampled the soil until winter in November. Now that it is spring, the Phoenix team cannot resist seeing if their baby survived. No one's betting on it, but if they get lucky, they might have to rename it Timex. You know, takes a licking, keeps on ticking. Sorry about the dated reference, kids. In warmer Martian climes, the Spirit rover moved a tad, or maybe it was a skosh this week. Good, but not good enough to make its way out of that sand trap it remains mired in. The Spirit team has not given up yet, but soon they may have to focus on tilting the rover so its solar panels can better catch the low winter sun. And here's a cool postcard from Mars showing the forest, or so it seems. This unusual image comes from the high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Apparently it is a dune field and those tree-like thingies, dust kicked up by dry ice. And check out this one. Looks like a bulldozer has been busy up there. The wind makes this pattern in the dunes. Those are boulders littering valleys in between. Desktop wallpaper, anyone? And listen up, shutterbugs. You want to try your hand at interplanetary photography? The team at the University of Arizona has started a new program called Pick Pixels on Mars. Just point your browser to the URL at the bottom of the screen, suggest a site, and you might end up with an enviable photo credit. You best not have a frozen budget if you want to buy a painting from the only artist who has walked on the moon. His name is Alan Bean, and this past summer I was lucky enough to get a tour of his Tour de Force exhibit at the Air and Space Museum in Washington. The fourth man to walk on the moon has shared the experience like no other astronaut. Alan Bean landed on the moon 40 years ago and conjures up his time there with Pete Conrad in vivid, vibrant detail. One of the fun things that happened that I remembered on the moon was I fell backwards a couple of times when I was backing up and tripped over a rock mm -hmm. in the dust or something. And I could turn over and get up, but it took a lot of energy. And so what would happen, Pete and I were usually close together, he would come over and pick me up. Mm -hmm. Well, the first time he came over and picked me up, he grabbed me and pulled like you would on Earth. Oh, no. And I came up like a <laughs> bullet, bumped into him, and we both almost fell over the other direction. The so, moon presented some other unlikely challenges as well. In fact, during the first moon landing, when Neil Armstrong famously planted Old Glory and the world erupted in joy, it turns out he was sweating bullets. Neil had some trouble here uh -huh. trying to get this to Flagstaff to go in, and he told me, I talked with him on the phone about it, he says, that was one of the scariest times of the mission. I said, why? He said, I couldn't get that Flagstaff to go in because the rocks up there have not been rounded by wind and mm -hmm. rain and mm -hmm. everything, and they wouldn't get out of the way of that Flagstaff. I said, what'd you do? And he said, I tipped it back until the center of gravity of this flagstaff, this 
curtain rod, we called it, and the mm -hmm. flag was over the hole. Then when it was balanced, we got away from it. it in no any case, Alan Bean's keen eye and uncanny talent for telling a story in broad brush strokes has brought him great joy and no small amount of financial success. His pieces can fetch tens of thousands of dollars. After all, he is an artist with a unique distinction, using some unique ingredients. You, you put moon dust in everything, right? I do, yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, let me show you over here. There's a piece up yeah. there from yeah. my flag. Uh, There's a piece down there from the NASA yeah. emblem. I selected these for this display. Yeah. And then up there is a piece from uh, my Apollo 12 patch. Bean prefers to be working in his studio, but during the 40th anniversary of the first moon landing this past summer, he took some time to savor the exhibition of his work at the National Air and Space Museum and to think about our future in space. My dream is that someday soon, I have no knowledge of when this would happen, that the nations of the world will get together and they'll say, you know, it's gonna cost a lot of money to go to Mars, but if we would do it together, America, you build the rocket. Okay, China, you're gonna build the launch facilities. Russia, we want you to build the electronics. You know, if we could do that, and then launch these guys off on a two-year or year-and-a-half-year mm -hmm. trip to Mars and back, it would have an incredibly unifying effect on this Earth. The Alan Bean exhibit is now closed. Sorry to report. Check out his website, though, at alanbeangallery.com. NASA is taking a cue from Walmart, offering the low price, always. The agency slashed the price to acquire an orbiter for public display. They were asking 42 million bucks, but just lowered the price to just south of 29 million, not including taxes, title, and dealer prep. Actually, you can't buy the orbiters when they're done flying. You're just paying for the shipping, piggyback on a custom 747. The higher price included the cost of safing the vehicles, meaning cleaning out all those nasty, volatile, and cancer-causing chemicals. But now NASA says it will pay for that. The buyers still have to figure out how to get the orbiters from the nearest airport big enough for that 747 to the museum. No dismantling allowed. The Smithsonian has already claimed discovery. A decision on where the others will end up will come this summer. So here's a question for you. What does an orbiter do to keep busy in retirement? Why, they play shuttleboard, of course. That's our show for this week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Miles O'Brien. We'd love to hear your feedback here at This Week in Space, so feel free to drop us a line. Laurels or darts are welcome. You can email us at twists at spaceflightnow.com, tweet us at at This Week in Space, check out our Facebook page. You can also check out our blog. It's at www.milesobrien.com. And you can subscribe to our podcast at iTunes. Got a great note from Peter Keats this past week. He offered this thought. Why not run a campaign for people to contribute towards getting miles up on Spaceship Two? Surely there are enough viewers of Twists who would be willing to contribute only $10 and pay for the flight. It would be Miles' job to present the real human element, fear, excitement, anticipation, etc., to those of us who cannot afford the trip, but want a greater understanding of what it's like. The resulting publicity would help garner further interest, I hope, in manned space exploration. Assuming that Miles would want to go, of course, he adds. Well, Peter, you can safely make that assumption. Thanks for the thought. Now my wheels are spinning. And speaking of spin in the name of adventure, check out this scene. That's a centrifuge at a place called NASTAR near Philadelphia a company that gives civilians a taste of the rigors of spaceflight and the thrill. And these astronaut wannabes are scientists who are hoping to take their research to new heights before too long. That's uh, when we take another turn at This Week in Space. We'll see you then.